All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. Today's topic is a suggestion. We love getting listener suggestions. And this suggestion comes from, let me check my notes here. Oh, it comes from Lizzo. Wow, that's amazing. A topic suggestion from the superstar Lizzo. I think our work here is done. Last episode, we had John Lennon. This episode, we have Lizzo. So we are on a real roll here. Um, No, look, this suggestion is not directly from Lizzo, but it is inspired by her because here is the context. We recently got an email from listener Xander, who said that at a recent concert in Central Park, Lizzo took a moment between songs to talk about some, I don't know, esoteric political history. She (laughs) said, quote, I have to shout out the land we're standing on, which is Seneca Village. Before it was Central Park, this was Seneca Village. And if you don't know what that is, it was an affluent African-American community that lived here and they were evicted and bulldozed so that they could build this park. So Xander heard that thought about us. Thank you, Xander. The Seneca village that she was referring to existed in the 1850s and in 1857 is when it was bulldozed. Eviction started in October of 1857. That is our hook. And Lizzo went on to say that it is important to talk about not just current pressing issues, but also the history of this country. So Lizzo, we're here. Let's talk about it. And here to do that, as always, are Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. And our special guest for this episode is musician Bobby Wooten. He is in David Byrne's brilliant show, American Utopia, which is on Broadway, plays bass in that. And if you've seen it, in my mind, the star of the show. Also, Bobby has been doing this Instagram history series, which is really fantastic, called America Learn Your History. So, uh, Bobby, thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. And, uh, and I've been trying to get you find a reason to have you on the show for a long time, just because I'm a fan of your work and fan of this Instagram series you've been doing. And do you want to tell folks what, what happened when I emailed you about this topic and said, oh, Lizzo said this thing about Seneca Village, this feels like it could be a good fit. And your response was? I was thinking the exact same thing. I'm in the process <laughs> of, of writing my episode right now. Well, there you go. So we're both inspired by Lizzo a little bit and looking into a really fascinating uh, part of New York history and black history and so forth. So I don't know. Let's talk a little bit about Seneca Village. I mean, Kelly, do you have a sense or anyone, do you have a sense of like what life was actually like at Seneca Village and why there was this encampment there? Yeah, I think it's first important to say that slavery was a big deal in the state of New York. And so for a long time, slavery persisted up until the 19th century. Uh, when slavery officially gets abolished in 1827. But there are um, pockets of black communities, large black communities, um, that are able to not just survive, but thrive in a free New York. And this community is is part of that. Um, 
network of other free black communities. They have homes and a school and churches and, you know, institutions that they have have created in which they uh, have autonomy in a way. That's just incredible when you think about the times. So yeah. Seneca Village really is, I wouldn't necessarily call it like the Wall Street of, of, 19, <laughs> you know, of the 18th century. It's not quite Tulsa, but the fact that it's able to exist in this way and have these institutions is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah. And village is a really operative word when we're talking about Seneca Village, because when people picture New York City, even in the 19th century, they picture a kind of bustling, if small, metropolis in the United States. And certainly downtown by the actual Wall Street, it was more like that. But Seneca Village was a, a fairly rural area. It was a place where you could you could go over and you could fish in the East River or in the Hudson. Um, you were surrounded by forests, so you could get firewood. And so it, it offered, in some ways, not just a respite for previously enslaved people, um, but also a respite eventually for some Irish immigrants who were yeah. moving out of the more densely populated lower part of the city. You can still fish in the East River and the Hudson if you want. I just don't know if that's what you want to subsist on in the not, way that Not quite did. as clean. <laughs> but Bobby, what, you know, what strikes you or what, what interests you about the actual sort of uh, community that was built up there? I mean, I think this is a time, a time before there was like really like this class and upper class and but these they would have belonged to somewhat of like a middle class. And it was a lot of labor workers. A lot of the women would do more domestic jobs. Um, I just found it interesting how the community was able to thrive and also harmoniously with the Irish immigrants that came as well, mm -hmm. which was not the case in other parts. I think that middle class part is really important because for many of the black families there, this meant land ownership and it meant a kind of wealth. And in New York City at the time, or in New York at the time, you had to, if you were a black man and you wanted to vote, you had to have at least $250 worth of property. And so for many of the families in Seneca Village, this allowed the men in the families to be able to vote. So it was an access, it was access to more than just land, but to citizenship. Yeah, I think that's so important because so many of us get the story of African-American voting as, as one in which we are denied. And that's that's true. But there are also small pockets of people that do have enfranchisement and can vote. Right. Something like 10 percent of the eligible black male voters were in Seneca Village. That's huge. Wow. That's huge. And, and that's a community of just about just under 300 people or so. And we should say there were three churches, a school, some cemeteries. Um, I mean, this is, I think, an obvious answer, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. I mean, you know, what is our sense, Kelly, of the reason for establishing a community like this um, that's, you know, that's a little uptown, as we were describing, separate mm. from, you know, the, the sort of heart of the metropolis? And, I mean, is this happening in other parts of the country or maybe even in the South at, at around the same time? Mm, that is a really good question. So, uh, you know, Wall Street is sort of known for its its famous slave trading market. It really is the hub of like a lot of slave industries, shipping, insurance companies. Um, so you didn't kind of want to be quite downtown. The further away you got from these um, commercialized spaces, the more freedom you had. And even before they start to change some of the laws, you do have small free black communities, um, but you had to sort of be on the outskirts of town. You always had to be on, on the edge. And as the city grows and as the city gets bigger and bigger, you start to see these shifts where black people are constantly having to move from one place to another place to accommodate mm -hmm. like growing, thriving metropolises like New York City. So it becomes really, really difficult to hold on to the things that they have, um, especially when they have something that, that is desirable. Right. And you almost get the sense that that's the catch-22 mm -hmm. almost, is that it becomes desirable when people see that someone has established a community yeah. there yeah. and been like, oh, yeah, you know, wow, that is a good idea to, to, to take over that part of the, the city or whatever. Yeah, it's the it's the uh, gentrification of the 19th century. <laughs> it, yeah. really, it really is. It really yeah. Is. Right. Uh, Bobby, what is your sense of what happens as the city starts to eye this this land? They some of the elite of New York decide they want a large park in in New York, but it would be the first public park in America. And um they kind of look at a, a couple areas. It ends up being this area is what ends up working out. But um, 
it was met with like a lot of protests for multiple years before everything would be demolished. And even some of the, the way it ended up compensating homeowners there, some got more than others, particularly if you were black, then there was the discrimination on that. I saw a letter too that um, Andrew Williams, the very first black homeowner in Seneca Village, he, he had three lots and they offered him like 2000 something and he thought it was like worth well over 4000 and he didn't get anywhere close to that. It was contentious, but the New York elite won and they used the media as a big tool to uh, yeah. get their way. Yeah, I mean, evidence of the value of the land is that all of these wealthy New Yorkers really, really wanted it. Um, but they weren't in a bargaining position because the city was able to take the land. Now, it was compensated, like Bobby was saying, but the compensation it just wasn't fair given how much the city wanted to build this park, how much they wanted that land. But they had the power. I mean, there's actually a, a really great quote from one of the newspapers at the time um, when Seneca Village is being cleared. Um, they say, you know, Seneca Village will not be forgotten as many a brilliant and stirring fight was had during the campaign. But the supremacy of the law was upheld by the policemen's bludgeons. Mm. And I think that suggests a couple of things. One, people actually kind of forgot it pretty quickly. Um, but also mm. that... This wasn't just, we're going to give you some money and you're going to move. It also was violence that helped to clear Seneca Village. And people are just not being compensated what their land was worth. So you're all of it's being undervalued. And again, this is also like a playbook that is so typical when it comes to like Black land and ownership is that they're almost always underpaid for what it's worth. And then, of course, you know, you think about Central Park today and who could afford a closet on Central Park, let alone, <laughs> let alone, a, uh, you know, a place to live. It is the most expensive real estate in all of not just New York, but in all of the country. Yeah, it makes me think of that story of Bruce's Beach in Los Angeles, yeah. right? which mm-hmm. was it's just incredibly valuable mm-hmm. p- property now and was basically taken for or, you know, for pennies on the dollar and once you start to really ask questions about restitution um and you think about how valuable that property is it opens up all sorts of interesting conversations yeah i mean it's just the the long thing of just equity and what could be now i mean i remember the bruce's beach thing a descendant was just like how would you feel if your family owned the waldorf and they just took it away from you and when i heard that quote i was like yeah not a single hotel chain is owned by anyone black or, I mean, many minorities, and then, or a fast food chain or any of these things that could have been like that and uh, could be a lot different the way it plays out. But eminent domain is like one of the biggest policies that have harmed black and like minority communities in general um, in terms of a government policy, period. And I mean, eminent domain used for public land, um, which is what this was, is, is a sort of interesting wrinkle as well. Often I feel like eminent domain is used to rezone or we think about like highways being put in by eminent domain. I mean, you know, this, this, the fact that this was all done in the service of Central Park, mm-hmm. which there is a story of Central Park as like a genuinely admirable public space. You know, we talk about Olmstead having real sort of, I think, laudable values about the value of public space. But this really just adds a dimension of who, who, who's being thought of as the public yeah. when we think about building public space. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such an important point to make because the idea of parks and and leisure and going to a space in which you could just sort of like frolic or read a book like that that was not commonplace people did that believe it or not in cemeteries or um because that was the only green space you know that that people had but they were not these places um perhaps beaches maybe but like having the parks become a huge part of not just new york cities but all like cities infrastructure thinking about spaces town fairs places where people can gather things where you can have an event like Parks become central, no pun intended, to Central Park, but central <laughs> to thinking about how we think about the construction of, of a city. And if you think about any major city across America, there are parks, multiple parks, and, you know, sort of think of their city in relationship to that park. So over the course of the last few years of the 1850s, 
Seneca Village is cleared out. The Central Park space for Central Park is built up. And I think one of the most remarkable things of the story is just how much it disappears from the public consciousness. And it's just not a story that's that's told. Um, it's over a century, I would say, that the story of Seneca Village basically disappears in the 90s. There's a sort of more radical uh, book about the history of Central Park in the late 90s. The Times does some reporting. Um, Bobby, I'm curious, like, your thoughts on why a story like this disappears and also the work of trying to tell these stories again and recover these stories, which, I, you know, is something that you really are, are doing a great job with with your Instagram series. Like, I'm just curious what you've learned about why it is that stories like this disappear. Because whose voice are we listening to on, on all of it? Um, I mean, in this particular instance, you even have when they're pre-demolishing Seneca Village, they don't, newspapers, New York Times, don't even refer to it as Seneca Village. It's right. just, the you know, shanty towns or scoundrels, whatever else they say. And so that acknowledgement is just never there from the get-go. So then after, after displacement happens, it's not like, there's no like microphone going up to them being like, so how do you feel about this? It's just like, uh, this is what happened. Now we have a park and we're moving on. So then here we are. And then it doesn't really come up till 1990, which is very wild. It's also interesting, too, because the 1990s, correct me if I'm wrong, this is when they're building a federal government uh, building in downtown Manhattan and they discover the African burial ground and they discover like hundreds mm-hmm. of um, of black bodies in this, but it's a, basically a black cemetery and how to reckon with that and how to continue to build and yet honor the bodies that are there. And I think it's just unfortunate that at the end of the day, you know, the the only thing that we sort of have to signpost this other than maybe a handful of books is a, f- a handful of signs or signage. And so like the symbolism yeah. there is just also rings hollow that there's no sort of like reparations. There's no sort of like reckoning to repair the harm that's been done. It's just here's a signpost that says you were here, you know, and then it, the rest of it just keeps moving. Bobby, how do you think about restitution and reparations in this context? We like symbols, symbolic wins and things, even now where it's like a statue is up in uh, Union Square of, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And it's like there's no actual sacrificing of something to give to somebody else that's been harmed by something. And until I could see like real sacrifices happening, it's a little uh, disheartening, I'd say. It's one thing to like educate and read and, and all that's great, but then but then it has to be like action too after that. Mm-hmm. And I just don't I don't see too much of it, unfortunately. Yeah. I think Seneca Village is the perfect case to look at for the broader case for reparations because the New York Times did this study in 1997 and they weren't able to find direct descendants of the people who lived in Seneca Village. But that doesn't mean that that generational wealth wasn't stolen and that generational harm wasn't done. And so thinking about all of the different ways that that has been done, particularly to black people in the United States over the course of centuries, it's not a case of going and tracking down individual descendants of individual acts, right? This is deeply structural and it can't just be done on that kind of one-to-one basis. Um, And so I think that broadens the conversation about reparations and repair. It has to be a broader Mm -hmm. nationwide policy or debate yeah did you see the um they did find one an ariel williams oh yeah and she is like the great 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 granddaughter of andrew williams and then wildly in their family one one thing we didn't say actually um they really valued education a lot of the uh the residents there the youth like made it past elementary school into high school which at that time was just like it was at a much higher rate than than the rest of new york but um, going along with that sense of pride, um, each, so Andrew Williams, he named his son Andrew Williams. They each had a different middle name and it just kept going. Like, so her brother, Ariel's brother is still Andrew Williams, but they found her and uh, they gave her a tour. I watched a video on that. You know, it warmed her up. There was no like, you know, restitution or anything, but <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a nice story. I mean, to get connected, I would say, you know, black people in general, it's like a lot of some are fortunate and know where they come from, uh, but a lot don't. And so um, it was cool to see where she could trace herself like that. Mm. Um, 
So on that note, and as we start to wrap up, I mean, the way we started this episode was with Lizzo doing her <laughs> part or whatever she could to keep the memory alive, right? Um, and so I'm curious, Bobby, like, you know, just we talked about this actually on our last episode a little bit, but, you know, where do you see artists, celebrities fitting into this? I mean, what is the power of someone like Lizzo being on stage and taking a moment to to speak these words? And does it connect to the actual on the ground compensation and restitution that we're talking about? Well, hopefully it can lead to that. I, I love that she used her platform to do that. She was there. That was beautiful. I think artists in general, I mean, one of the best things about being a writer is just imagination. If you imagine the world for something not like as it is, but what it can be, then, um, you know, you use that to change anyone's perception mm -hmm. about anything. Um, the more artists can use their platform to persuade people or change perceptions, mm -hmm. then the better maybe we can all be. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a great note to end on. And I will say, Bobby, you know, I think you're an artist who's doing that and you're working with David Byrne, one of my personal heroes who I think has done that throughout his career as well. And so, um, you know, thank you for that. And this has been really, really fun. I'm going to be going to American Utopia in a few weeks. So I'm very excited about that. Oh, yeah. Let me know when for sure. Yeah, I will. Um, all right. But Bobby Wooten, you can check out his uh, series on Instagram. So you're Bobby Wooten 3 on Instagram. And the series is where can people find that? Uh, at America Learn Your History. There you go. Okay, so check that out. And uh, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thanks, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. I have to shout out that the land we're standing on is Seneca Village. Before it was Central Park, it was Seneca Village. As we talk about climate change and making the world a better place and solving homelessness, we also have to talk about the institutionalized racism that happens in this country all the time. And if we don't talk about our history constructively, how can we build a better future? Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is the only software your business will ever need. Featuring a suite of integrated business applications, Odoo connects your business operations together so you can get more done in less time. Odoo has apps for everything. CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, marketing, manufacturing, you name it, Odoo's got it. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O D O O dot com slash this day. Radio Tokyo.